Welcome to Small Practice Support Information Session number 54 with Pat McCluskey talking to Justin Purcell about managing legal account regulations. So I'm here okay. with Pat McCluskey. Uh, we're going to be discussing legal accounts and regulations, and today's agenda is compliance breaches, a summary by Pat McCoster, who's uh, from CBS Legal Bookkeeping Specialists, the Law Society Responsibilities and Inspections, a quick reference guide to SAR breaches, and tips for preventing breaches and any questions. So, so Pat, I'll hand it over to you, and uh, you can share your screen, and we'll take it away. We're going to take questions on chat, and I think Pat says uh, after about 20 minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll answer, start answering those questions just to give the, the presentation a bit of flow. So if anyone has a question, you can answer uh, over the chat. So Pat, you're very welcome and over to you. Okay, Justin, thank you very much. Um, as uh, Justin says, my name is Pat McCosker. Uh, anybody that's listening is very welcome. Um, uh, my background roughly is that I spent about 30 years in banking and I have spent about another 20 years um, in managing solicitors accounts for various solicitors in the West of, of Ireland. Okay, so today we're going to deal with managing legal accounts, uh, the regulatory compliance uh, and we're going to uh, touch on um, various different breaches that can happen, which you need to be conscious of. Okay, so um, just one second, I can just get in here. Right, okay. So if we look first of all at the Law Society responsibility um, uh, in relation to clients' account, the Law Society's responsibility would be to serve, represent, and support its members and the public to ensure that fair and effective regulation of solicitors in the interest of the profession and the public and to protect the interests of the client where specific responsibility was a specific responsibility for inspecting the correct treatment of client monies uh, and to educate, advise and guide solicitors uh, in respect of the safeguarding of client monies in accordance with the solicitors accounts regulation and to minimize claims on the Law Society compensation fund. And when I was getting prepared for this about uh, half an hour ago, I was just actually thinking about it. Uh, and uh, I suppose to me, um, especially with my, my career in banking for 30 odd years, like, you know, clients money is something that needs to be really respected as clients money. Uh, and I was just thinking of the scenario that if you were out for a cup of coffee and you came back and sat down at a table with some other people at it uh, and you put down your coffee and your change of five odd euros uh, and you were getting yourself settled and somebody across the table put their hand across and lifted the five euros. Uh, I'm sure you'd be having awards with them and possibly even accusing them of stealing your money. So we need to be very sure that whenever we're dealing with client funds, that we look on client funds in exactly the same sort of way. Uh, if you are ending up with 20 or 30 cents in the client account, you have to remember that that money belongs to the client and not to the solicitor's practice. And unless you can um, uh, justify the taking of that money, then you should not be taking it. And apart from justifying it, you would now need to have it uh, inserted in your, your section 150. So law society inspections can happen. Uh, they can be carried out by an authorized person with or without prior notice. Uh, all accounting records must be made available and the authorized person may require uh, written authority to inspect your bank account. And recent inspections have focused on the likes of small frequent debits um, arising on client ledgers, which is indicative of poor accounting procedures or maybe even slightly a bit more deeper. Um, they also check for the likes of office accounts and credit, uh, long outstanding client balances, dormant accounts, which is really becoming a big issue at the moment uh, with the Law Society. Um, because people are just not finishing off ledger cards. Like, you know, they're, 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 they're carrying on and doing the work and, and closing the file without actually printing off a ledger card and looking at it and seeing if all the transactions have been completed, which is what you should be doing. Uh, the inspection would also then be looking at the likes of Section 150 compliance, which you will all know about. Uh, and a big thing at the present moment is compliance with money laundering regulations. And money laundering is becoming more and more of an issue um, uh, for both bankers and the likes of, of solicitors. So regulatory breaches actually occur where, first of all, if you fail to lodge without reasonable cause, all client money is received to the appropriate client account. So if you receive any money from a client, uh, it must be lodged to the client account. Uh, and also, for example, if you receive split money from the client, which I'll explain in a second, that should also be lodged directly to the client account. So if you had a client that come in to you and give you 250 euros, uh, of which 
123 euros was for your professional fees plus VAT. Um, and the other 127 was for say to pay various different disbursements. That full 250 should be lodged to the client account and you should then transfer across your 123 euros from client into office. You cannot split the money and put the 123 direct into office and the 127 into client. So it's important to remember that. Um, and it's also a regulatory breach for you to fail to record without reasonable cause the money in the practice accounting records. Um, so, you know, when you get the money in, you, you have to record it within your system as well to be it either computer, computer or manual system. It's a regulatory breach for uh, solicitors to be holding money in client uh, account, which the solicitor is beneficially entitled to. Uh, and a solicitor cannot keep money in client account for a longer period than three months. Um, a fairly common practice out there would be, uh, an example would be where we'll say, for example, that you happen to get fees of about seven or 8,000 in relation to a particular case, uh, and you decide, and you get this money in March, and you decide that you're going to hold on to that uh, until uh, October, November, when you have to pay your preliminary tax, and you hold on to it in client account. That is actually a breach of regulations. You cannot hold that money within client, within client account for a longer period than three months. So it's also a regulatory breach that outlays uh, expended by the solicitor uh, and what they're entitled to are not withdrawn as well from client account. And money held on a client matter which the solicitor is beneficially entitled to uh, a share of it with one or more other clients um, also needs to be taken across within the period of three months. So it's important to remember the three month rule uh, that any money that you have in client account that you're entitled to, um, then you should be taking it across within three months. Another scenario that I've come across as well too is where, for example, a solicitor might uh, decide to remortgage their own private home uh, and um, maybe get 100,000 extra in their mortgage uh, and they place that money in client accounts and then they use it over a period of the next 12 or 18 months to do renovations in the house or to maybe change their car or whatever. That is also a breach of regulations. It's not client money, it's the solicitor's funds. So therefore should be transferred across immediately into your office account. It's also a regulatory breach to withdraw money from clients uh, account with, uh, that is held on behalf of the client concerned or drawing against uncleared funds, thus causing a debit balance to arise. Uh, and in this instance, uh, uh, or sorry, what I should also say is that um, if the debit is offset by um, a credit on another ledger card, then it is acceptable, but you should actually do a matter to matter transfer immediately. So your computer system should have some sort of report that would actually show you a list of overdrawn client accounts. And in my opinion, you should be checking these on a daily basis. To breach also to not record without delay um, a bill of cost to a client. Um, um, so for your professional fees, so it's important that you, know, you, you keep your systems up to date. It's also a breach of regulations to withdraw from the client account, uh, personal or office expenditure. And one of the issues to look out for here is that if a solicitor is entitled to um, motor expenses um, uh, in, in, in relation to a particular matter, uh, these motor expenses cannot be paid out of client account directly to the solicitor. What you need to do is you would need to issue a disbursement out of the office account and then transfer the money from client account back into office account then to pay that disbursement but you cannot take the money directly from client account and just put it into your personal account without recording it through the office. <clears throat> so regularly breach also um, to not correct in a timely manner a credit balance on the office side of the ledger card, um, providing it's not offset in its entirety by a debit balance on another ledger uh, for the same client. Um, so, you know, if you transfer money across from client account into office account, then you should automatically be uh, issuing your bill of cost so that the office account um, ledger card is not shown to be in credit. <clears throat> it's also a breach uh, taking fees or interim fees or outlays from the client account that are not properly due at the time of the withdrawal. Um, you know, and, and a case that I would think of in, in, in relation to this would be, um, you know, I see on regular occasions with some client with some uh, solicitors. Um, they're dealing with a particular client in relation to the purchase of a sale of a property and uh, the deposit is lodged in and, and immediately the solicitor is taking their fees. Um, you know, you shouldn't be taking the fees until the bulk of the work is actually completed on the file. 
so if your auditor from the Law Society comes in and discovers that you're taking fees immediately, then they're automatically going to be suspicious that this is um, a practice that's under um, financial pressure. Um, and it's also um, a breach uh, to not properly record um, the PE uh, of a bank draft on the check that has been issued in respect of that. So if you're going to the bank and you're looking for a bank draft and you have a check with you, then you must also record on the check the name of the clients uh, that you're looking for the bank draft for. So regulatory breaches also um, apply to control trust accounts. And as you all know, no control trust account is where uh, the solicitor has sole access to, the, to that particular money. Uh, so there could be executor of an estate, uh, which would be a controlled trust account. Um, so it's a regulatory breach that the money for controlled trust accounts is not lodged as soon as it's received or that you fail to record uh, the money in the accounts or indeed that you cause a debit balance. Just because you're the executor of the estate doesn't mean that you're allowed to uh, overdraw the client account. Um, so um, controlled tr trust accounts and non-controlled trust accounts would have exactly the same regulations. Uh, so also with insolvency accounts, uh, and you should also ensure um, that you, when you're dealing with insolvency uh, accounts, that you have separate matters for every single insolvency that you're dealing with. You cannot have them all bulked together. Uh, the same would also apply in relation to general clients. Uh, you know, if you have a client and they happen to be selling uh, five or six different properties. It's not acceptable that you would um, deal with all the transactions for those five or six properties out of the one ledger card. Uh, what you should be doing is you should be setting up um, your client and then setting up individual matters for the individual uh, ledger cards for the uh, various properties so that each particular ledger card only has the transactions on it, transactions on it that actually relate to that particular um, uh, matter. Solicitor must also account to their client for interest um, uh, where the client is earning more than 100 euro of interest, which is very unlikely nowadays. Uh, but just to mention the fact, um, you know, if, 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 if you have money belonging to a client and on general funds and the amount of interest that would have been earned for that particular client is more than 100 euros, then the solicitor must account to the client for that particular money. And if it's a case that they don't have it, uh, in a client account, in the, um, in the client account by way of uh, an interest um, payment coming from the bank, then they must account for it out of their office account. Uh, also, if a client comes in and specifically mentions that they want their money kept separate in a separate client account, then all of the interest received for that particular client account must go directly to that particular client. Um, you know, you can't decide that you're going to take part of that yourself and give two thirds of it to the client. Um, where a general um, client account has earned interest, then that is classified um, and, and none of it is in excess of the 100 euros for any one client, then that would be classified as um, solicitor's money and that money should also be taken across within a period of three months uh, of the money having been credited to the client account. So your minimum accounting records is to meet your obligations to the law society is that you should have cash books to record your debits and credits and if you have um, if you have um, a computerized system, then automatically you have that. If you don't have, then you're going, you should be keeping them on a manual system. Um, the uh, records of all lodgements as well to the office, to the office account should also be recorded. Uh, and a journal should also be kept of any interledger transfers. So if you're doing matter to matter transfers, then you should have a separate report in relation to that. Um, you should have a register of all bank accounts held detailing the bank, the branch, the account name, the account number, uh, the opening date, etc., cetera, uh, and who the authorized signatories are on those particular accounts. Um, you should also be keeping the origin of all paid checks on the client account, uh, and these should be kept in numerical order. Uh, don't fall into the trap of dumping them all into a box so that when the auditor from the law society comes in, they discover that they're not in numerical order. If you keep them in numerical order, you keep the um, Law Society Auditor are happy. If you don't, then you're certainly going to annoy them. You should have a copy of all drafts kept in the individual files. Uh, a matter file containing all documents should also uh, be kept for every individual matter. Uh, you should have copies of every bill of cost, uh, and you should have a copy of each balance and statement for both the client and the office account, uh, and a copy of your reporting accountant's report uh, sent to the Law Society. They should be all kept together as well too for all the various different years. 
So a few tips uh, for the preventing of breaches is, uh, first of all, lodge client funds immediately. Uh, and this is becoming a bit of an issue from the perspective that the banks are now, or have done in the last couple of months and, and will continue to do, in my opinion, uh, close in various different branches. So you could find yourself in a situation that you're practicing in a town uh, where there is no bank branch or the, the bank that you deal with don't have a branch in that town, but maybe that they're about 30 kilometers away. Uh, it is your responsibility that if you receive money from a client that you should be lodging it into the bank account within 24 hours at the very outside. So there's no point in getting the money from a client on a Monday and holding it and saying that you only go to the bank once a week because there is no branch in town. That's just not acceptable. You need to do it within the 24 hours. You should understand your obligation for the accounting of interest. Uh, when you're dealing with somebody in relation to the purchase of a sale, um, you know, you should have your stamp duty to hand. And you, if you're dealing with somebody with a purchase, you know, you should ensure that you that you talk to the client beforehand to make sure that they have funds or that they can provide you with proof of funds to cover the total purchase. So you know, your deposit, the, the uh, remainder of the balance, and then also the likes of your stamp duty and various other disbursements, and most importantly, your fees. Uh, and if they can't prove that to you, I'd be reluctant enough to uh, proceed with it, um, you know, because you, you need to ensure that um, you're not going to end up with, with egg on your face at the end of a, a couple of months. Uh, I would strongly recommend that you should consult your uh, up-to-date client ledger card uh, every time before issuing a debit uh, from client funds. So constantly pull the ledger cards. It only takes five or 10 seconds to do it, uh, and I would certainly be encouraging it. Um, you should wait for lodgements to clear before drawing funds against them. You know, it's becoming less and less of an issue now in that we have EFT for most lodgements. But uh, if you are getting lodgements coming in, always wait your five or seven days to ensure the funds are clear before you would uh, draw any, anything against them. You should have a good understanding of your accounts and the reports and specifically the ledger card. You know, there's no excuse for you to turn around and say to the auditor uh, that um, you don't understand the client ledger card that there's somebody else in the office is doing that for you. You need to understand it yourself. You should be reviewing your monthly reconcili reconciliations and you should keep uh, on top of all old outstanding uh, checks. You should also maintain register of will, deeds, estates, undertakings. You should maintain an anti-money laundering uh, file. Uh, you should not borrow money or lend money to your clients. And you should review your age debtors and dormant balances to prevent delays and fee transfers. And you should issue bills to your client uh, when fees are being taken. You should complete all registrations, fully comply with section 150, keep records of your anti-money laundering procedure. And we would actually recommend that what you would do is you would have a laminate, which would show uh, what your anti-money laundering um, regulations are uh, and uh, what your cash handling is, policy is as well. Although I would stay away from cash as much as possible. Um, and uh, you should also control the issue of uh, signatories on checks uh, I would strongly recommend that if you're passing that responsibility off to somebody in your office, then there should be at least two people signing on the checks. And the same would apply in relation to undertakings. Although, to be quite honest with you, I would not be inclined to pass off that, that uh, responsibility to anyone. I would refrain it from myself. As I say, you should manage the handling of cash directly from clients, and I would try and avoid it as much as possible. And you should also um, uh, look after the control of um, of checks itself. My last couple of words of advice would be the fact that first of all, if you discover that you're that they're in difficulty, that um, your reconciliations are not completed, or that you have overdrawn client balances, you need to address um, issue, these issues quickly. Uh, if you don't know how to do them, or you feel that it's getting too much on top of you, then I would strongly recommend that you look for help somewhere. There's various different people within your profession that you can turn to, uh, um, as well as that. You know, your accountant may be able to help you, although at the same time, they might be too busy. But there are specialists out there like the likes of ourselves that, that can help people. Uh, I would only be too happy if anybody gets into difficulty, pick up the phone and give, you, give me a ring. Our, our number is actually on this presentation. Uh, give us a ring. But whatever you do, do not bury your head in the sand. If you have an issue, there is only one thing you can do with it, and that is you must deal with it. Uh, and you'll find that when you deal with it, that it'll be a lot easier to, uh, to look after. And then at the end of it, then just have a couple of references of uh, material and useful links. But the main one that I would I would mention here is the anti-money laundering guidance uh, from the Law Society. And I've given you a link to the website there. Uh, and there's various different forms and, and rules and regulations that the Law Society have 
um, on that particular website. And I would strongly recommend that in relation to the assessment of business risk uh, and in relation to um, checking on customers, I would strongly recommend that you uh, download those forms and have a look at them. And that's me. All right. Uh, if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to uh, take them at this stage. Listen, Pat, uh, thanks. Oh. So there's a few questions there in the in the chat if you want to have a go. So uh, how long is it, is it allowed for client monies to be recorded as such in the account system from the time of receipt? And then there's a follow on question there. Can you see the questions, Pat? I can see them now. Yeah. How long, how long is it allowed for clients money to record it as such in the accounts? Well, look, you know, my strong recommendation in that is that your accounts should be updated on a daily basis. If you don't have your accounts updated on a daily basis, then your ledger card is of no use to you whatsoever. Uh, you know, and I see practices out there, especially small practices where, you know, they think that they can carry everything in their head. But the reality is that we can't. You know, there is only one way to do this. You know, the recording of receipts and payments uh, on, on average in any system should take approximately 15 seconds. You know, and the majority of practices could record most of their transactions within the first 15 minutes. Now, there are other issues that need to be handled in relation to the accounts that can be left to later on. But certainly in relation to uh, receipts and payments, I would record them immediately. So then the, the follow on question there is regarding interest on client monies and negative interest rates. What's the best practice? Is that the same? Uh, right. Regarding interest on client monies and negative interest rates. What? Best practice in terms of funding for this commuting interest client. Well, first of all, like you know, the regulations are that in relation to negative interest, um, <clears throat> and I, I assume this question is more about negative interest than, than positive interest, if we want to call it that for a better name. But the regulation is that um, it must be recorded as a disbursement in your accounts and then transferred across from the client to the office account to pay that disbursement on the strict understanding that you already have mentioned it to your client in your section 150. OK, I have actually done a review for a number of my clients in relation to it. Like, you know, and if I take an example of a client that would have approximately about 400 live clients, um, maybe around about three million in client funds. When you look at the interest on the majority of those accounts, approximately 95 percent of them are an interest charge of 20 euros or less, um, maybe even 10 euros or less, actually, on a monthly basis. So. I would be inclined just to charge those clients that have a larger amount in their accounts. And for the smaller ones, that what you would do is cover your interest charge uh, by way of an increase in your postage, providing you've notified the client under Section 150. You know, but I've seen other practices where they go and they post all the transactions. You know, they're posting five cents here and seven cents there. You know, it's a mammoth task. All right. Okay, but so the, the next question there from Michael was uh, time to change the 24 hour rule to lodge regulation. And, and that's possibly is the case. Yeah. But <laughs> a lot of what we've been talking about today, I'm struck by checks and cash and lodgement. But where does internet banking or electronic banking sit within all of this? Are the principles the same or is well, do you have like, thoughts you know, on that? No, well, the principles wouldn't be the same from the perspective that, like, you know, if you get a check or, or cash, then you're, you're stuck with an item that you must go and lodge in the bank. Uh, if it's an electronic transfer coming from another bank, then it's automatically going into the bank for you anyway. Um, you know, the comment in relation to time to change, say, that's 24 hours to lodge, uh, to lodge regulations, then I actually wouldn't be inclined to agree with that comment. Like, you know, my, my attitude to that would be that it's time to change our clients to all go to internet banking. Yeah. You know, I certainly would not be happy uh, if I was the principal in the practice and I was receiving... 10,000 from a client by way of a check or otherwise, I would not be happy holding on to that check until Friday and then going in and lodge it in the bank and it taking another five to seven days to clear. You're then looking at 14 days of a cycle. You know, I think it's time to change the client's attitude so that they don't lodge checks or cash anymore. And I, I know Michael has come back there and said government offices don't do EFT, but I think there's been a change to the Maybe not all offices just yet, but it's coming because revenue were on here a couple of weeks ago around the new professional withholding tax, and that is going to be moved to an electronic system. So right, right, uh, okay. I think it, I think it's coming, Michael. It's coming. Um, uh, uh, another question there was uh, from Tony: clients yeah. can't be found. Yeah. Uh, any ideas there? Yeah. <laughs> well, this is one of my bugbears, and and uh, they want to step on toes here, but like you know. Sure. 
uh, first of all, the, 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 there is actually very little that you can do with it. Um, what you, what, if the client can't be found, the client can't be found. Um, some of the solutions that I have, that I have seen um, by auditors down through the years is that possibly what you would do is that you would isolate that particular client funds into a separate client account, okay? Uh, and that you would, whatever interest is earned on that client account, you put it into an orderly demand deposit, uh, whatever interest is earned on it would then actually go to the client itself. You know, that's about all that you can do with it. You know, um, you know I think there's a question to be asked whether the law society should be doing something themselves in relation to dormant accounts. I know that's thrown a lot of responsibility onto the law society, but my understanding is that that's the system in Northern Ireland. Like, you know, that's an, and in the UK, that what happens is if you have dormant accounts, you pass them off to the law society uh, who have it, themselves, the client comes back in 20 years' time, the law society pay the money out, you know. Okay. So just moving on then, uh, Pat, as we come to the end now, uh, can small balances uh, be cleared off by applying a closing fee? If so, what's acceptable? acceptable? Any guidance on that? My guidance, my guidance is I'll go back to what I said about the cup of coffee. If you come in and you sit at a table in the cafe and you put down your five euros odd and somebody puts their hand across and take it, are you going to be accusing that person of stealing your money? In my opinion, the answer to that is yes. Okay. The only safe way to deal with, with, with small client balances is number one, ensure that you don't have them because you should be looking at your ledger card every time that you go to pass a debit on it. And secondly, if you do have them, my strong advice is irrespective of cost, uh, issue a check or a postal order and send, them out, send it out to the client. Because the day an auditor comes in and discovers that you have taken it and you don't have it in your section 150 or your section 68, then I can assure you one thing, uh, it's not going to be a very happy day for you. But there's just a, a couple of balancing ones there. I'm just going to share the future sessions that are coming up uh, right, okay. as, as we come to the end. But if you just, uh, I think there, there was a comment there, I, I think really is, is, is an overall comment that people should move towards a, a electronic uh, internet banking, if possible. Yeah, see the yeah. see the one here, um, and see the one here in relation to government officers. Don't do EFT. You know, all I can do. My only comment in, in relation to that is I laugh. You know, I just don't understand why governments don't do this. Anyway, I think they'll change. I think it's coming. I think it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. To avoid checks. Yeah, absolutely. The moral of the story is definitely to avoid checks, drafts, and cash at all costs. But if you if you you know, if it's a case of maybe losing a client, then I would suggest that you 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 do your thirty mile or thirty kilometer round trip. Um, so open new accounts. Sorry, the thirty kilometer mile, uh, round trip to your bank and back again. Try this one. I should have said, open new accounts not on with negative interest situation. I'm not sure what that means. I think it's just maybe maybe if you open more accounts, there's there's an issue that you get charged more negative interest rate. I maybe Michael, you you could clarify. But anyway, we're coming to the the end of uh, today's session, Pat. Thanks, right, okay. thanks a million for imparting uh, all, all of your information. If anyone has any queries, uh, Pat, you're you're open to taking questions from people if they contact Absolutely. you directly. I'm going to share Absolutely. the slides. Yeah, I'd be only only too happy to talk to people yeah, if they if they want to talk to me. I'm going to sh oh, uh, share the slides and a, a copy of the recording uh, later in the week. Uh, next week's session, we're going to be talking to DocuSign about the benefits of e-signature back to this uh, adoption of digitalization. And then our final session for, for, for the summer will be the introduction to, uh, to the new law, digitized law directory app. So it's no longer a printed version. Uh, we're taking a break in August um, and we head into Donegal. Pat, you'd be delighted to hear. All right. And, uh, you may call and we'll have a coffee. As long yeah. as you don't take my change. <laughs> but you'll, you'll be buying, Pat. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> no, I'll be buying. I owe you one, Pat. And uh, if anyone has any topics they want to talk about uh, in the autumn series, I, I'm open to uh, send, send us a, an email with any any thoughts or any things you'd like to see covered. So we're delighted having you all here with us today. I think there might be a, is there a final piece of chat there just before we close off? Um, I think the point very much. I think the point that's been made here is that you know you, that you would split your your um, client account to various different banks. Uh, the big issue with that at the present moment is that all we're really left with in this country is Bank of Ireland and AIB. Uh, and if you go on to AIB and you're a Bank of Ireland customer, they'll not actually take the money at the moment. Okay, okay. You know. So it's, it's complicated. Listen, yeah. everyone, thanks for joining us. We're, we're back next week to talk about, uh, talk with DocuSign about uh, e-signatures. Um, Pat, thank you very much for your time. You've been okay. a great sport. Sloan, thank you very much, everybody. Around.